So yesterday I wrote a proposition on the board, but didn't have time to prove it. So we'll get back. We'll go back to that uh, proposition now, which you also saw in the. Uh, I think exercise number two was also about this proposition, but uh, um, we're missing the proof. So first, let me remind you what the statement was. So we had two transfer matrices T and T prime with different Boltzmann weights, A, B, C, and A prime, B prime, C prime, respectively, while all these numbers are greater than zero. Um, and the question was, um, you know, can we find a reasonable, sufficient condition for, for the transfer matrices T and T prime to commute? And, and the statement is that if there exists a uh, so-called R matrix, which is this endomorphism of C2 tensor 2, so a 4 by 4 matri matrix, such that a certain identity is valid, this R L relation, then the claim is that indeed the commutation of T and T prime uh, is true. And so what is this identity? Well, it's easier to first look at it kind of graphically. Remember our graphical conventions, all the external edges are supposed to be fixed and labeled. I did not label them out of laziness, but, but you really think that all of them are labeled. So that you have fixed spins, say, plus or minus um, on each external edge of this diagram. And the equality should be thought of as an equality for every choice um, of all these external um, I'm missing a few, here we go. So this equality should be thought of, that this should be true for wow. any sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, sigma prime one, sigma prime two, sigma prime three, all of which say are plus or minus. And um, so that means it's really 64 different equalities condensed into one. And another way of writing it is using this kind of a tensor notation where the indices here are not the, in, you know, this is not the matrix indices, these are eight indices telling you on which a uh, factor inside C2 tensor 3, these operators act. For example, R only acts on the first and second f tensor, where the idea is that each line corresponds to a, a certain copy of C2. And when you have several lines, you always you should think of it as, you know, several lines means you're taking the tensor product of the corresponding uh, vector spaces. So in this way, you can, you can check that indeed, you know, this equality is the same as these diagrams. One more thing is, um, yesterday I put kind of a big arrow to indicate the direction of time, that means which way you're taking products. Uh, on this picture, I did something slightly different. I put the arrows on the lines. It's a, a bit easier to actually follow, but you have to be careful that these arrows, the reason I didn't do it yesterday is because you don't, you don't want to confuse these arrows with the arrows of the six vertex model. This, these have nothing to do with the arrows which specify which, you know, which value of the edges uh, um, you're, you're considering. So these are different arrows, but on the uh, exercise sheet, um, we use that other, a choice of arrows, so let me switch to that one. So this is the, the, the complete picture. And so that the question is how, how to prove the uh, commutation relation. So to do that, we're, this is the, the, the first time we're really use, gonna use this graphical language in a kind of interesting way. We're gonna first tr translate the hypotheses graphically and then we're gonna actually prove uh, everything graphically. So the first question is, what is really the R matrix? So, um, so the R matrix is really a four by four matrix, that means you should think of it as, okay, um, it has indices, you know, sigma one, sigma two, sigma prime one, sigma prime two, where each of these is a plus or minus spin, and graphically that means um, it's um, sigma one, sigma two, I'm just reproducing once more the same, same story. Um, by the way, it's kind of a little bit heavy to have, to be forced to mark every vertex with e either R, L, L prime to, s to specify which uh, Boltzmann weights we're using. L has A, B, C, L prime has A prime, B prime, C prime, and R has A second, you know, A double prime, B double prime, C double prime. Don't worry, eventually these letters will disappear. They'll be, we'll find a better way of keeping track of the different uh, Boltzmann weights. But for now, we're actually forced to, you know, remember which one is which. So this is the R matrix. And, and the one thing we want to um, dis describe graphically is the fact that it's invertible. So invertible means there exists another ma matrix, R inverse, such that, you know, R, uh, so the, so you, um, so R, R inverse equals R inverse R equals one. And so what does it mean? So R, R inverse um, graphically corresponds to this picture. Uh, we're first applying, um, okay, so this one would be, we're first applying R inverse. Um, and then applying R, and the result should be the same as 
applying first R and R, R inverse and should be the same as the identity. So what is the identity? Let's start with the easiest part of this equality. You know, the identity should be thought as the, really the identity matrix for my form matrix. That means you're saying it's really secretly the matrix that says, you know, the input sigma one should be the same as the output sigma prime one and so on. So that means this is really nothing but um, with these notations sigma one, sigma prime one, sigma two, sigma prime two. So we just, I'm just drawing an edge since it's the same edge. Of course, the label has to be the same. So that means it's just the Dirac, you know, this is the, the same as saying the, uh, the, the Dirac sigma one, sigma prime one sigma two, sigma prime two. So that's the, the identity matrix in this kind of, a, you know, this is all in end of C2 tensor two. So that's why we have two lines because it, you know, this is in C2 tensor two. And, and the other ones are pretty much what I just said. We, uh, you know, each, each time you have a, a, a vertex, um, well, I mark it with R, if it's R, I mark it with R inverse. And, and the, the, the fact that these edges are identified is just the matrix product, the natural matrix product of the four by four matrices. So that's the first part we need, this series of equalities. Um, the uh, second one is what does it mean to take products of transfer matrices? So we, this exp expression means explicitly uh, T, T prime equals T prime T. So what is T, T and T prime? Uh, T times T prime, sorry. Um, so that's also very easy. We know how to, what separately T and T prime are. They're supposed to be about, so let me do it first. Okay, let's try to do it right. So, okay, uh, T prime first. So let me draw what T prime is, right? So this is supposed to be T prime. So we're supposed to have this picture where at every vertex we're supposed to have a little L prime. And there are periodic boundary conditions. And really again, so I'll, I'll do it once more with indices and then I'll kind of give up on the indices. Um, okay, yeah, so explicitly that means if you have a sequence sigma one, sigma L. Okay, let me erase this error. Um, sigma prime one, sigma prime L. Uh, this is supposed to be, you know, everywhere. So uh, as usual, all the external edges are fixed. And once again, if I don't label them, it doesn't mean they're not fixed. It just means that I'm too lazy to write all the indices explicitly. But um, this is the picture. And we've already seen that, you know, when we're taking products of uh, transfer matrices, this is really about vertical concatenation. We use this argument already to, pr to prove that the partition function is the trace of T to the power L in the usual case. But here we have two different transfer matrices. We have T prime, we also have T, which is exactly the same picture but with L instead of L prime. And the product, as I said, is just the, the, you know, the matrix product is just saying that these two lines are really the same line. So we get this picture. And obviously, if you, if you compute T prime times T instead of T times T prime, you get exact same picture, but where the, the role of L and prime, prime is switched. So really what you're trying to do is kind of move L prime up and L down or vice versa. And you can see how this equality kind of looks pretty good because it does seem to switch the roles of L and N prime. So let's try to actually do the proof now. So we start from T T prime. There's really only one um, identity we can use, which is this, the fact that the R matrix is invertible. Here we have some straight lines, so we can arbitrarily cut anywhere you like, say we're gonna cut it here and insert this identity in here. So this is also equal to, so, L everywhere, L prime everywhere. Uh, oops, I didn't actually cut it. So we're cutting it. Um, and then we're saying, oh, but we can, we can, we can insert, let's say, this one. So we're going to do that. Okay, I don't have much space to do that. Uh, this is not so great. I should have made more space. Okay, let's try again. A little bit more space. And here we have, let's say, R and R inverse Glee. They're going to play completely symmetric roles. Um, and so everywhere else is L prime, and that's pretty much it. Okay, and then you see that the interesting thing is now we can apply, say on this side, uh, this equality that looks exactly the right form. That's convenient, so we can move, um, uh, we can replace the left-hand side with the right-hand side, and we get, okay, let me continue here. Uh, so this is using the RLL relation. Um, and so how, what it's gonna look like is now we have maybe only two of these on this example. And then we have this, 
then we have a line in the middle, then it switches again, and we have, say, two more, L, L, L prime, L prime, uh, L, um, um, right, so this is the part where I have to be careful. Now L is here, L prime is here, L, L prime, prime. And so this is already, you know, the, you know, this bit has been replaced with, with this bit, and conveniently L prime and L have been switched, so that looks pretty good. Uh, of course, now you can, the, the point is now once you've done it once, you realize you can do it again, because, you know, each time we're, so we had this area where we apply the um, RLL relation, but now we can apply the exact same argument to this bit. That's again the left-hand side, so we can apply, we can replace it with the right-hand side. And each time you do this, what happens is you move the crossing uh, of the two lines one step to the left. So it's kind of you're unzipping, it's an unzipping argument. You know, you're trying to open your, you know, jacket by, a, you know, except it's a periodic jacket. So eventually, if you do that sufficiently many times, you'll get back to the original spot. So after a certain number of times, um, what you'll find is that the, oh, the only thing I forgot to mark, ooh, this is a bit too high now. Okay, I'm stuck. This was supposed to be an R matrix, and this is supposed to be R inverse, but I can't do it anymore. Okay. Anyway, so once you've done it many times, using the fact that it is periodic, the R matrix is going to actually appear now on the right of the R inverse matrix. So you'll get, um, so now, whatever, however many lines we had originally, and then we have this R inverse matrix, R, and then however lines, many lines we had at the beginning, and now the nice thing is now L prime is on top everywhere. Here L is everywhere, L prime, L prime, L, L. Surprise, now you recognize that this bit is nothing but the other equality, the fact that R times R inverse is the identity, so we can remove this bit. And we get just exactly what we wanted. Which is nothing but uh, T prime T. Right, so it's kind of pretty. Uh, the, um, so, so this is kind of a local relation which implies this kind of global uh, commut comm commutation of uh, transient matrices. All right, so, so this was wh where I was supposed to, start, uh, to stop yesterday, and in particular, at this stage, the, uh, the question is uh, how to compute, you know, the actual question of, in the case of the 6 vertex model, can we find such an R matrix? And that was the object of um, your exercise 1.2 which uh, hopefully you had a look at yesterday. And the uh, answer you get from, um, so, the, uh, so the answer is that um, there exists indeed an, an well, at least a non-zero a matrix um, when, well, sorry, so the existence of R uh, yeah, only if um, a certain condition is satisfied by the weight. So in other words, it's not true in general. You know, this is a linear system, basically. So if, if you try to solve it for R, you have to, you know, the system has to be sufficiently degenerate for, for, it, for it to have a non-zero solution. And explicitly, if you do the calculation, that was the point of this exercise 1.2, you find that you need to have an identity of the form delta equals delta prime, where uh, delta is uh, a squared plus b squared minus c squared over 2ab, and similarly for delta prime, but with all the primes. Um, and in fact, there was more than that, then you find that the R matrix actually, um, you know, um, right, so this is assuming that R is of the form, yeah, which I already mentioned, B second, C second, C second, B second, A second, double prime. And then, and then you find that actually, and, and uh, delta second is also equal to delta. That means that the exact, all these numbers are the same whether you use A, B, C, A prime, B prime, C prime, or A double prime. B prime, double prime, uh, C double prime. Um, so at this stage, the question is, how can we, you know, may, maybe we can now reparameterize in a slightly better way our Boltzmann weights, uh, in particular avoid having to carry all these, you know, extra labels. There are way too many labels already on the diagram, so how about we do a bit of reparameterization? So what we do is the following. So this is also, this was mentioned in the last question of 1.2, but we hadn't had time to actually do it, so let me do it now. Um, 
for in all that follows today, I'm going to always assume that delta is not equal to plus or minus one uh, for technical reasons. Uh, you can always consider this as a limited case. And um, so it's not a big deal, basically, to remove these two points. We will eventually, in the fourth lecture, talk about essentially something which is kind of like delta equals one. But for, for today, let's just assume that delta is not plus or minus one. And in this case, uh, you can always write so um, delta in the following form. Uh, where Q is an, uh, a non-zero complex number, and in fact this is unique up to um, substituting Q with uh, Q inverse. So if you try to solve this equation for Q, this is a quadratic, a quadratic equation which has two solutions which are inverses of each other. So it doesn't matter which one you choose, but let's say you, you pick some a Q which satisfies this identity, and then the proposition is that um, um, up to overall normalization, uh, you can always write, so that means up to multiplication by a common factor, which is irrelevant for, uh, you know, compu computation of, um, of the, um, the, the, you know, the, if you multiply all weights by a common factor, that doesn't change the probability of any state. You'll, you'll just multiply everything by a common factor and it will be canceled by the, in the probability distribution by the, petit, by the uh, normalization condition. So the overall normalization doesn't really matter. You can multiply all the A's, and B's, and C by a common factor. And so up to that normalization, you can always choose A to be QZ minus Q inverse Z inverse, B equals Z minus Z inverse, and C equals Q minus Q inverse, where Z is another, say, uh, complex number, non-zero complex number. And the proof of this is not terribly interesting, so let me write it really quickly here. Uh, because the, uh, so we've assumed that all our A, B, C are non-zero. Um, All right, so uh, yeah, so this is the part where I use the fact that um, delta is, uh, okay, well anyway, let me write it. Um, because of the fact that the uh, normalization of the, of, of the weights is arbitrary, I'm gonna choose C to be whatever I like, and, and C I'm gonna decide, you know, this is by convention, I decide that C is Q minus Q inverse. And if delta is not equal to plus or minus one, this is actually non-zero, which is uh, all I care about. So up to, you know, I can, I can set it equal to any non-zero number I like, so let's choose um, Q minus Q inverse. Once you've done that, all the other weights, now, now the overall normalization is fixed, so now I have to fix B and, and A, and B, I declare that it's gonna be of this form. Again, this is just solving a quadratic equation in Z, so this is a, there is definitely a Z that satisfies this. It's not very hard to see. Uh, again, solving this quadratic equation, and then it's, an, uh, it's a basically an exercise to check that uh, if you now compute A as a function of um, so now you can compute A as a function of uh, B and C by saying that uh, because, because delta is fixed, F, B, C, because delta is fixed, and check that it actually is of the form that's required, basically. So I'm not actually doing the calculation, but it's, you know, you, you actually compute it, and you find that sure enough, it's indeed QZ minus Q inverse Z inverse. So it's, uh, it's just, you know, three lines of calculation. That's right, so that's right. So as usual here, there are two choices, and you choose whichever you like, it doesn't matter. All right. Um, once we've done that, uh, we realize that in this way we can uniformly parameterize L, R, sorry, L, L prime R in this way. So in other words, we can write um, all of them in terms of the same, you know, in the same parameterization, and so instead of having, you know, this is where I'm gonna finally get rid of my L and my R, I'm gonna declare that everybody is an R. So let me define now R of Z to be, uh, just this, oh, okay, so I guess I should have written. So both my L and R matrices are not gonna be just uh, R matrices, basically. So, because they're not fundamentally different. They're, so if you write it this way, then that means there exists a, you know, Z, a Z prime, and a Z second, so that, such that I can write in my proposition, L equals R of Z, L prime equals R of Z prime, and um, R is just R of 
It's a double prime, basically. And the next statement, um, right, sorry. Um, the proposition is that um, uh, you can always choose, one can choose um, z second to be z over z prime, basically. So again, I'm not going to do the actual proof. This is um, kind of implicit in exercise 1.2, and maybe for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to skip that. But it's, it's literally just a check. Uh, you check that indeed. Uh, so you know that R has to be of this form. The only question is, what is, what is this Z double prime as a function of Z and Z prime? And it turns out that at least one choice, again, there are some bu stupid binary choices to be made, but up to some stupid choices, you have to impose Z double prime to be the ratio of the two Z and Z prime, so, which makes sense. I mean, we, have, we know that R should be essentially unique, uniquely determined by uh, L and L prime uh, generically, and so this is the answer. <clears throat> so I don't have too much to say about that. It's, uh, once again, you can, uh, um, well, this is part of, uh, this is essentially related to that exercise that you did yesterday. Um, one important thing now is that we can sort of simplify a lot now the uh, graphical description, because if you start looking at this picture now and trying to understand where these parameters Z and Z prime and, well, and Z over Z prime live, you realize that something really convenient is happening. So this is kind of like a simplification of our graphical notation. Um, you see, somehow, we want to think of now Z to be somehow attached to, to this crossing and Z prime to this one and Z over Z prime to this one, but actually there's a better way to think about it, which is as follows. Um, how about I declare that each time I have two lines, instead of being forced to indicate at every vertex, um, you know, which Boltzmann weights I'm using, what I'm going to do instead is as follows. I'm going to attach a line to, uh, I'm going to attach a parameter to each line this time. So, it's, so it does look a bit messy because now we already have so many labels on our, on our pictures, but it's still a little bit more economical than to have labels on each vertex. So we have, say, label here Z and here, well, if I change, let me use W. And you should think of it as the, 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 the parameter propagates along the lines through the crossing. So this is also Z here and W here. And then I'm going to say that in this case, I choose the Boltzmann ways to be given by Z over W, where the, the convention is always that you take the parameter attached to the left line divided by the parameter attached to the right line when you're looking in the direction of time, so to speak, of the progression. Um, so, you know, that's what you, we used to label by putting a little R over Z over W at the crossing. But the reason this is convenient is that, is that it neatly uh, works with ratios here. Because if you, if you use now these notations, uh, for, for this picture, in fact, how about I do it directly on the picture? We can remove now these labelings. I'm also going to remove, as usual, all the spins because it gets really messy. As I said, we have too many labels, but you have to remember that, of course, all the external edges, as usual, are fixed to some value. And with this convention, you see that, um, so here we need to have the ratio z over z prime. Well, that's convenient. I'm going to put a z here and a z prime here. Uh, and the other two now, well, this is also z, right? So maybe I'm just going to put a 1 here. And same here. So z is always here, z prime is here. And if you check carefully, you'll find that if you use the rule that at every crossing, you're using r of the ratio of the two weights, of the two, spectro pro of the two parameters, um, you will get exactly the identity I wrote with the choice L equals R of Z, L prime equals R of Z prime, and R equals R of Z over Z prime. Yeah, incidentally, those parameters Z is, are called uh, spectral parameters. And just a name, but since I'm, I may use it. There. All right. Um, one interesting feature at this stage is that you realize that actually you know, what, we still, it's, this picture is not completely symmetric yet because we have a one here and then Z and Z prime. But actually you realize that it makes absolutely no difference. You know, if, even if you use a number attached to that line that's not one, all you're doing effectively is, you know, changing. So let, let me write it up to, yeah, up there. C 
So up to redefining z to be z over w and z prime to be z prime over w, uh, the equality, oh, the more general identity holds, uh, which is as follows. Um, you can equally well write, um, Well, the same identity where now we have W here, Z here, okay, maybe I put it here, Z prime here, and the other side. And now, once you've done that, it becomes kind of more, a little bit more symmetric. Um, and you can see this is strictly equivalent to the previous one. You just substitute in the previous one Z equals Z over W and Z prime equals Z prime over W, basically. So the advantage is this is almost completely symmetric now. In fact, we can redraw the, the even the, the exact same identity can be written in a slightly more um, pleasant way by saying that really what we're doing is we have, I'm just gonna redraw the same thing. Um, it's not a terribly well-drawn picture, but anyway. All right, so equivalently you can write it in a, in, in the following way, where all the lines are now pointing up. You know, I'm allowed to deform lines in any way I like as long as, you know, I'm not changing the actual topology. And, and I may as well maybe call them now Z1, Z2, Z3, just to make it look a bit more neat. And we get this identity, which is the same. Where I just relabeled everything and kind of rotated the picture to make it look nicer. Um, now, this looks exactly like, um, so this is known as the Young-Baxter equation. It's an equation which is kind of, it's just, it, you might think it's essentially the same thing as the R relation and you'd be right, but the only thing is now we are not giving, we're not giving different roles to the different vertices. All these vertices are basically the same. They are different, just the same eye matrix with different, different values of the spectral parameters. And so this is the most important equation in this whole business. Um, I'm not gonna go over the history of uh, how it was discovered, but um, it's a long story. But, um, um, you see, th th this picture, of course, is reminiscent of a lot of different things. Um, oh yeah, and by the way, you can rewrite it more explicitly. So in, in the language above, that's like R12 of Z1 over Z2. Um, R, so it, of course, it's just the same, pretty much the same expression, except we just re replaced everywhere. So Z2 over Z3 equals, really? Oh, I switched. Ooh. I'm not gonna redraw it. Okay, fine. This is supposed to be the other around, I guess. Yeah, sorry. I switched uh, left-hand side and right-hand side at some point. Uh, yep, indeed. All right. Um, really? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, well. Um, okay, so this is the explicit uh, identity in the kind of the tensor notation. So there's one final thing I need to check. Uh, for this argument of, of um, f for this proposition to work, I have to, I have to assume that R was invertible. So the question is, in, is it true in this case that R is invertible? Um, and the answer is actually very neat as well. Uh, it turns out that the inverse of R of Z is basically up to normalization R of one over Z. So yes, it is invertible, at least for generic uh, values of Z. Um, all right, I guess I have to start erasing. Correct. Uh, the short answer is no. The longer answer is, of course, it's closely connected. Uh, if you didn't have those spectral parameters, then it would be literally the, uh, braid, braid the, the third right master move, which is the braid relation, if you prefer, in the language of braid groups. And then you would be able to obtain from this, indeed, exactly that, a, what's so-called quantum link invariant, which is uh, not invariant, if you like. Um, and, but this would take, I mean, it will not work here because of the fact that you have those spectral parameters. And in fact, you'll see, in fact, that's, yeah, how about I answer your question right after I do this uh, computation of unitarity? That will effectively tell you why it fails here. And this is something to do, 
Yeah. Okay, let me, let, let me get back to your question in literally one minute. So first let me do the, inver the, um, the, the, the relation, um, the inversion relation. So we want to compute the inverse of z. So the claim is that as follows, if you compute r12 of z, r21 of z inverse, let me first write the formula and as usual I'll interpret it uh, graphically. Um, times the one, where at one is as usual the identity of uh, uh, C2 tensor C2. Okay, so what does it mean graphically? So R12 just means you do this, you have lines, so, you know, among the many labels we have attached to lines, there's also secretly a labeling, which I used to mark with a um, color, so this is line one. And then you see that once you're here, you actually really want to apply R21 because the line two is now on the left. And the, so that's what I mean by R21. I just mean literally this, all right? And then conveniently now, if you see, if you have, uh, say, Z here and, um, well, Z1 here and Z2 here, uh, and you, you define Z equals Z1 over Z2, at the point, from the point of view of this crossing, it's R of Z, but from the point of view of this crossing, because now we have Z2 on the left and Z1 on the right, it's actually Z inverse. So this, this is literally the same as this. And the claim is that this is actually nothing but some factor, which I'm not gonna write again, times the identity, which is this thing. So that's the graphical interpretation of this equality. And in particular, you see that's exactly, oh, I erased it, but that's exactly what we needed to show the, you know, the fact that R is uh, invertible. It's saying that this is invertible up to, up to this number. So as soon as, as long as this is non-zero, so as long as the, uh, um, this factor, which I'm not going to rewrite, is non-zero, um, you have uh, R is invertible. And which is good enough for our purposes. Let's just say for now that we avoid, the, there are special values, of course, for which this factor vanishes. So the, 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 the only problem happens, you know, when z equals, um, let's see, plus or minus q plus or minus one, uh, something bad happens. And this needs to be treated separately. And we'll just declare in what follows that we do not have this situation here. It, will, it would not happen anyway with the positive Boltzmann weights, but in principle, uh, so trouble. And this needs to be investigated separately, and it's quite interesting. It has, it's, it has some deep representation theory behind, but we're not gonna, we're gonna, in what follows, we're always gonna assume that, you know, Z is not equal to uh, this. Uh, now, to answer your question, you see why this is really bad, because this secretly is right to master move two, and it's telling you that actually, well, no, actually, the point is here, it looks like we're at master move too, but actually it's not, because the point is we're not distinguishing under crossings from our crossings. So it's telling you that no matter which way your, 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 your two braids are connected, whether they're actually really separated by move two or actually interconnected, it's trivial. Um, so that's the basic problem here, is that you don't distinguish under crossings from over crossings, and any knot invariant which does not distinguish under crossings from under crossings is trivial, because any knot can be re re related to the trivial knot by such a procedure of replacing undercrossings with overcrossings. So it's not gonna work. You need to do something a bit different if you want not invariants. And, um, and so it's not, yeah, not directly related to what we're doing today. All right. Um, right, so that's all good. That means essentially up, up to some subtleties of avoiding some special values, we have, a, we have an R matrix which is invertible, which satisfies the ECM Baxter equation, that's for, therefore which satisfies RLL, therefore the corresponding transfer matrices commute. And that's supposedly something nice. We don't really know why yet, but you know, it's telling you that the model is integrable secretly, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of believe that this is a good sign, an encouraging sign, and keep going. Um, right, uh, in practice I should point out the fact that if you actually ask uh, the Boltzmann weights to be real, then Q, yeah, I was a little bit sloppy when I'd say Q is complex number. Uh, I should point out the fact that I should have said here, uh, if A, B, C are positive real numbers, then uh, Q is actually either of modulus one or uh, Q is a real, a real non-zero number. Uh, is this true? Yes. So actually, um, so there, 
so the, in, so in, a, in a sense, we're working very formally. So for all practical purposes, our Boltzmann weights could be complex, but at the end of the day, if you really want to do real statistical mechanics, there are some conditions I'm not always writing. Like in this case, that means you can't take any value of Q. Q has to be either um, modulus one or um, real. So I'm skipping a little bit the, um, uh, the, the kind of actual physics, though eventually I'll, I'll have a few words to say about that. All right, so how do we proceed from, from there? Well, you remember that the goal was supposed to be to actually diagonalize the transmatrix, which we haven't really made any particular progress in doing. Um, and to do that, we have to use something called either the quantum inverse scattering method or the algebraic betons, that's, which was uh, invented by the uh, Fadiev school of, um, well, the Len Lenvigrad school of, school of uh, quantum integrable systems. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to do a little bit of algebraic beta ansatz, and we'll talk about the, the so-called Young-Baxter algebra. Um, so let's start with the Young-Baxter algebra. So the idea is that we're going to use slightly more general operators than just the transfer matrix. The transfer matrix is not enough for our purposes. To diagonalize the transfer matrix, we need some other operators. So the idea is we're going to introduce a bunch of operators acting always on C2 tensor L, uh, which will help us diagonalize the transfer matrix. And so how are these operators defined? There's really only, you know, we can only define everything in terms of the R matrix. So we get back to our construction of the transfer matrix, but now we don't impose uh, periodic boundary conditions. We say, how about um, we actually keep f our freedom of doing something to the, the two ends? So we're not saying that this is actually identified with this. So in this picture, remember my conventions, that means we have to actually fix this to be something, right? So that means, really, I'll do it once more. That means here we have sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, dot, 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 sigma L. And here you have sigma prime zero, which may or may not be equal to sigma zero, et cetera, all the way to. And this object uh, we, we'll consider in full generality. So it's, it's something like, you know, in terms of indices, it has now L plus one indices. Ah, oh, oops, too many primes. Um, so that means w that corresponds to a certain uh, endomorphism this time of C2 t tensor L plus one. And this is known as the monodromy matrix. Yeah, because um, T, straight T for me is the transfer matrix, so the monodromy matrix is curly T. For some reason, we tend to use the same letter for both transfer matrix and monodromy matrix, which is really confusing, but it's not my fault. Otherwise, the RTT relations would have to be called something different, so yeah. So this is curly T, yes. And with the conventions we had before, we're also supposed to mark what the uh, spectral parameter is, so let's say we always choose it here to be one everywhere and Z here, so that effectively the, the R matrix at every um, intersection is just R of Z, which means explicitly T is just R01, uh, R02, dot, 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 R0L, where for the purposes of this picture, I'm labeling the lines starting from zero rather than one, and, uh, oh, sorry, and, and the argument of the R matrix is just Z. And so the only difference with the transfer matrix is I'm not taking the trace. And that's why the, the partial trace over the zeroth space, that's why it's an anamorphism of C2 tensor L plus one rather than C2 tensor L. So in other words, if you want to go back to the transfer matrix, you just have to take the trace over zero, which is the definition we had earlier, right? So we just, that means in practice, you know, in this formula, that means we're taking, uh, you know, T sigma one prime sigma prime L sigma prime, sorry, sigma one, sigma L, is just the sum over sigma zero of T uh, sigma zero, sigma prime one, sigma prime L, sigma zero, sigma one, sigma L, where there's no more sigma prime zero because it's actually equal to sigma zero. Right. All right, so it's a slightly more general object, and in fact, um, it's convenient to think of it as follows. We want, you, you see that there are, the horizontal line clearly plays a different role than the vertical lines. It kind of goes through everybody else. Morally, it's some kind of auxiliary space. 
This is the actual space on which the transfer matrix acts. It's some, sometimes called the physical space, and this is the auxiliary space. So we really want to separate this C2 tensor L plus one as being C2 tensor C2 tensor L. Right, where this C2 is the horizontal line, and this, uh, these are the vertical lines. Now, if you do this decomposition, what does it mean in terms of the, the actual matrix uh, curl ET? Uh, actually, I'm going to erase this one. Well, that means you should think of it as follows. When you have tensor products and you're doing matrices, that means you have some kind of block structure. So in this case, there are two ways you can think about it. Either you're saying T is actually secretly a um, L, two to the power L by two to the power L matrix whose entries are themselves blocks of size two, two by two matrices, or the other, or the other around. We prefer to do the other around. So let me say that I can think of T as being a two by two matrix whose entries are two to the power L by two to the power L matrices. So let me write it this way. It's always conventional. We always denote T. Oh, by the way, did I actually write? Yeah, I should probably have written T of Z everywhere by now because of the fact. Yeah, all good. I wrote it here. Yes. Right. So that means explicitly T of Z is equal to a two by two matrix where each of these A of Z, B of Z, T, C of Z, T of Z. Okay. Okay, I'll keep forgetting the, to write the parameter Z, but okay. I apologize in advance because it's gonna happen all the time. I just operators on C2 tensor L. And if you prefer in terms of these, uh, of these indices, that means this is fixing, you know, sigma prime zero to be plus, this is sigma prime zero to be minus, this is sigma, so each row or column uh, corresponds to a certain value of, of the um, horizontal line at the, at the end, right? So that means in practice, uh, for example, if you take A of Z, it itself has a graphical description, which is uh, the one where you're saying, okay, so these are as usual, whatever they are, I'm not gonna write their actual indices, um, but this one is, so what is it? A is plus plus, so that means we have a plus here and a plus here, and I guess um, with my line convention that I occasionally use, that means it's actually occupied here and occupied here. Similarly, B of Z is gonna be, uh, so let's see, let's think, re think really hard, so I guess sigma prime zero is minus, so that means you have a line coming in from the left, but there's nothing coming out from the right. So you see how we're already breaking those periodic boundary conditions. And there are two more cases which I'll let you figure out, where C is when you have a light coming, coming in from the other side, and D when you have empty, empty, basically. Yeah, so I guess the empty I, I denoted with little dots maybe or whatever. Somewhere like that. And so on. Does that make sense? So in particular, if we want to recover the transfer matrix, uh, it's supposed to be the trace over zero of T of Z, so it's literally the trace of this matrix in the sense of this block structure. So it's literally A of Z plus D of Z. And it makes sense because A of Z means we're enforcing the fact that this particular edge is occupied and D of Z would be the same where we're enforcing the fact that it's empty and these are the only two choices and you have to sum over them. So this is the monotony matrix. Um, right. Now, the, the key point is that these monotony matrices satisfy as a consequence of the RLL relation of, or Young Baxter equation, whichever you like, these are equivalent. They themselves satisfy a certain uh, system of, of, of relations, and, and which essentially define the Young Baxter algebra. So let me write the, these relations. You know, we, we, we call them, yes? Correct, it's a trace. You know, when, you, when you're doing the trace of a matrix, it's like sum of, over I of A, I, I, right? So you have to sum both in the input and the output of your matrix. So that's what I'm doing here. All right, so essentially what we're gonna write is just, you know, the same relation we wrote before, the IRL relation, but in terms of this monodromy matrix. And 
And imaginatively, this relation is then called the RTT relation, where t L has been replaced by T. So the RTT relations is pretty much what you can imagine. Um, it's basically more of the same argument of applying repeatedly uh, the RLL or the young Baxter equation. So let me do it immediately graphically, and then I'll write it in uh, equations. So we start with a situation where we have a product of, um, which lo looks very familiar, of course, from the proof of commutation of transfer matrices. So it's almost the same argument, but now we don't have periodic boundary conditions. So we have an R, so we have a Z1 here, a Z2 here. We have, let's say, one everywhere. And uh, we consider this as, as an operator, where again, there is no, no periodic boundary conditions. And we say that we can apply repeatedly the young baxter equation or the RLL relation to move that crossing across. Because remember, that's essentially what all these relations do. They allow you to move crossings of two lines across other lines. And so if you apply repeatedly uh, the young baxter equation, what you get is that at the end of the day, the crossing has moved all the way to the, to the right. And since we don't have periodic boundary conditions, that's as far as it goes, basically. Right? Uh, but the nice thing is that this is still Z1, this is still Z2. So of course, we still have something has, has been switched, right? So what does this, um, what does this identity tell us? Well, so l once again, let me do, so it's going to get really confusing in terms of labelings. I keep changing between starting from 0, starting from 1. So I guess here I don't have two zeros. So I'll have to start from 1, I guess. Zero and zero prime, or <laughs> I don't know what I usually use. I, I'll, I guess I'll switch to one and two. Sorry, there's a bit of a, uh, the labeling of the lines is a bit uh, variable depending on the, on the picture, but it doesn't really matter. It's just, uh, um, right. And, and so the, all the lines collectively, uh, they're, I guess they would be numbered from three to whatever, but I'm not going to actually write it this way. Let me give a symbol to, for all of them collectively. So let me call it phi for physical. And with this kind of slightly, uh, you know, condensed notation, this is just R, R1, 2, oh, and, and you have to always read uh, expressions from right to left, which is annoying. If Leibniz had known how many times it would create trouble for us to write from right to left. Anyway, um, so R1, 2 of Z1 over Z2. Um, and then, okay, so now we have to think carefully. Uh, when lines cross, the first one that uh, first crossing that happens is uh, number one, so that's T1, phi of Z1, oh, just Z1, and then T2, phi of Z2. Did I get the ordering right? Pro okay, let me do the other side, and, and then we can check that it's uh, I got it right or not. Um, and now, of course, it's the other way around. The first one that happens is the uh, number two. Yes, that's correct. So what does it mean in practice? So once again, you should think of this identity as, as just being a condensation of many different identities written as just one big identity. And in, and in this case, what are the external uh, edges. There's all the, the physical space, so to speak, the, this phi, which I don't really want to write explicitly because it's just too painful. So it's just, you know, again, I'm going to kind of put it in, in blocks by saying there are, the, in other words, there's a sigma 1 here, there's a sigma 2 here, there's a sigma prime 1 here, there's a sigma prime 2 here, and there's a bunch of more, more indices which I really can't be bothered writing. And for each value of, so for each um, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma prime 1, sigma prime 2, you still have an equality. Uh, you get an equality, which is still, of course, a, um, a matrix, but this time an equality in uh, and of C2 tensor L. All right, so it's a whole bunch of identities. So how many precisely? Well. Each sigma one, sigma two, can, each of these can take two values. So they really have 16 um, it identity between matrices of size two to the power L, basically. So it's a very condensed notation for many different identities that are satisfied by these uh, um, uh, monotony, by this monotony matrix, basically. So very explicitly, these are quadratic relations because you see T appears always twice in the left hand side, twice, twice in the right hand side, and um, 
Maybe this is a good time to do a quick digression. Um, right, so be, before, so we'll, we'll have to write these equations more explicitly because we'll need them for the algebraic bitons. That's, but before doing that, let me do a bit of a digression. Ooh, I even erased the board and didn't use it. All right. Digression. I promised that I would not do any representation theory, but I, because of the fact that Oli apparently have, has defined for you the notion of a Hopf algebra, I can't help saying a few things about the young Buster algebra and the underlying algebraic structure. So it's very tempting to think of this in a slightly more formal way by saying that this expression is the um, definition of a certain algebra. These are the relations that are, you know, when you want to define an algebra, you have to define generators and relations. And these are very nice looking relations, the quadratic relations. And so, um, so th this is essentially a definition, if you like, uh, the young baxter algebra. Um, associated to R, where R is a certain solution of the young baxter equation. In our case, it's the uh, R matrix of the six vertex model. So in our case, is a uh, C2 tensor two, but of course, you, the only thing that matters is that R satisfies the young baxter equation. So by the way, if you want to know more about this digression, there, there is one exercise in the ex uh, today in the exercise session which talks a bit more about this. So. Here it's really just like a digression in the course, but if you're interested, one exercise goes a little bit deeper into the uh, structure there. Okay, anyway, let me continue. The master algebra is uh, the algebra with uh, generators, um, let's say, so in our case, A, N, B, N, C, N, D, N, where N is some uh, non-negative integer so, and which we always uh, encoded in some generating series, in generating series. Um, A of Z equals some N greater or equal to zero, A N, Z N, and so on. So I'm, I'm not gonna write all of them, but obviously you do the same, play the same game for all of them. So you, you, you compactify all these generators. There's an infinite number of generators, but you find you form, you form formal power series um, for all of them. And uh, relations, oh, okay. So I guess I have to be, oh, ah, yeah, yeah, I remember now. I, w I wanted to put a little hat on these. Um, the hat here is to distinguish the abstract algebra element from the actual representation in terms of matrices that we're using. Uh, I'll forget the hats, I'll have the time, but at least for the definition, let me try to put hats everywhere. And relations, um, and of course, in the same way, we can define T hat of Z to be the two by two matrix, A hat of Z, B hat of Z, C hat of Z, hat of Z. So it's a two, two by two matrix of power series in the generators of the algebra. It looks a bit heavy, but that's exactly what we need here. And relations, which are of course nothing but the, these relations. So essentially, T um, hat. So there's no more physical space. It's become kind of abstract. So really, the relations just take this form: R one two Z one over Z two equals. Um, so this R matrix is literally the usual R matrix. It's, it's an actual matrix, but these are actually, you know, algebra-valued uh, um, matrices. So they live in some kind of abstract space which may or may not be our favorite, uh, you know, which that doesn't have to, yeah, it's just abstract algebra, basically. Um, oh, sorry, and the, the, the right-hand side is the obvious one. Maybe I'll put it at the bottom. Um, one of Z1, two of Z2. So again, that means if you expand this equation, there are really um, 16 different equations involving these generating series at A hat, B hat, C hat, D hat. And each of them, of course, you're supposed as well to expand it in power series in Z, and you get a whole bunch of, like an infinite set of relations. So it's a very big algebra. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay. So the, there are several answers to the problem. So the first thing is the R matrix itself can be, okay, yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, I should have made a remark. 
to, to make this definition, the, the reason that you can, I can get away, which is, yeah, it's a good question, is up to normalization, you can always assume that R is actually polynomial. So in my case, you're right that naively R is a Laurent polynomial, but really R of Z can be chosen to be polynomial, but just multiply by some uh, uh, Z to some power, probably is just multiplying by Z, right? And then, then it, my definition makes sense. Uh, it does seem like a bit of a cheat, and it's a, it's a subtle issue, basically, but, but there's no problem doing it this way. Um, you can always indeed assume, yeah, you can always renormalize everything as, so everything is, because now if, if you had Laurent polynomials, the problem is um, you certainly don't want to have an expansion that goes from minus infinity to plus, plus infinity, because some of the relations would become uh, meaningless, right? So you could get away probably with having like Laurent power series, that means having a finite order in negative powers of z, that would be fine as well. But I certainly don't want to have powers going all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. So because of the fact that R of z is really polynomial up to normalization, it's actually perfectly well defined this way. Um, all right. So why am I mentioning this? Right, so in terms of representation theory, you should think of these actual concrete matrices T1, uh, well, these actual matrices as written here as a representation of the algebra. That means a mapping from uh, the algebra to endomorphism of C2 tensor L, yes? It's a T, it's a curly T, yeah. Phi. Phi is just, I got lazy, and I, phi is just collectively all these indices, three, all the way to whatever, L plus two, basically. So it's basically the indexing for all the, all the, all the spins which live in these kind of vertical spaces. It's, it's the basis, if you like, of, you know, C2 tensor L. But I'm not going to write, I, I'm, I'm getting tired of writing all the time all these uh, things together. So you just use one symbol for all of them together. Does that make more sense? So in other words, when I write T1 phi of Z, I really mean uh, R1 3 of Z. Oh, probably I have to go backwards. So R1 L plus 2 of Z, R1 L plus 1 of Z, dot, 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 all the way to R1 3 of Z, I guess. All right, so it's just a convenient way of not rewriting all the indices explicitly, that's all. No, because the, uh, my, my rule is you're always reading from left to right. So this is one, this is phi. So one is always, or, and two are always to the left of all the physical, all the horizontal lines are always to the left of all vertical lines when you're following the direction of uh, time. So it's always one phi, two phi. All right, and so, yeah, so it's just a nice way of formalizing the fact that, you know, there are generators which are these series, power series A, 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 B, C, and there are relations which are quadratic relations in, in these generators. Now, the only thing I want to, extra I want to mention is this, uh, the fact that there is actually a nice structure here. It's not just an algebra, it's actually a bi-algebra. And, and this, of course, smells already a little bit like algebraic combinatorics and like co-product co rules and stuff like that. So it's nice to see that there's a little bit of uh, extra algebraic structure. So let me explain this. And, and graphically, it has to do with the fact, you know, we have two basic operations we can do. Uh, we, we can do concatenation, vertical concatenation of diagrams, and that's exactly the, the product, in some sense, of the algebra. Because we know that, multipli we already said many times, multiplication is basically concatenating vertically diagrams. But what about the, the horizontal concatenation? When we used this to decompose the um, transfer matrix S product of L matrices, we use this kind of horizontal concatenation. Well, this is actually nothing but the coproduct. So the claim is that uh, there exists a coproduct, that means there exists delta, which is a map from, okay, so maybe I should give a name to my algebra, A, curly A. Uh, so, so delta is a map from A to A tensor A, and it's a algebra morphism. Um, which, which makes this a, which makes A a bi-algebra. So I guess, do, do I need to write the axioms again or was it given by a, uh, which makes uh, A a bi-algebra? Um, oh, and also I need a uh, uh, co-unit, sorry. Uh, 
the base field, let's say, is C. Doesn't really matter, whatever your base field is, uh, which makes A a bi-algebra. Uh, so yeah, so I don't know if, um, did, did Ola give all the rules? So, so uh, bi-algebra means you have a bunch, so first that means, uh, okay, let me just write it, say it in words. Uh, that means first, A with a delta is actually a co-algebra, which means it satisfies co-associativity and uh, the property of co-unit being the co-unit, so to speak, and co-unit property. And the fact that uh, the two structures are compatible, and that I already wrote, the fact that the that delta itself is actually an, a morphism, an algebra morphism, or equivalently that uh, multiplication is a co-algebra morphism, whichever way you like. Um, all right, and so what is this map, delta? I'm gonna describe it graphically. So, what does it mean graphically to consider T of Z now? So T of Z, you know, this is gonna be a bit fuzzy, and you know, this is just to justify basically what the, the rule is going to be for the co-product. Co In a way, you know, T of Z, you should think of this this way. So two by two matrix made of A of Z, B of Z, C of Z. So as usual, that means you have this physical line which has indices which are like pluses or minuses. But then there is nothing else. But the, nothing else means we have some stuff crossing it, which we don't really know what it is, and maybe I'm gonna use another color, which we haven't used before. Right, maybe. And maybe I'm gonna do a weird line like this. So this is morally what you, you should think of as being T of Z. And this line is really just telling you that this is actually a, it's not just a two by two matrix, if you only had this line, it's a two by two, two, by two matrix, which is kind of algebra valued, where the, the, the red thing is supposed to be kind of the abstract space of the algebra. And the delta is supposed to be about, um, so the, the basic idea is that you should have delta, with this notation, delta T of Z should literally be just uh, this. So it's the horizontal concatenation. So very explicitly that means, um, okay, so let me write the actual formula. So it's a formula which gives you again in power series, so it's, it's, it's saying that if, if you write, so. It, if you write delta t uh, sigma sigma prime of z, where sigma sigma prime are as usual in plus or minus one, and that means you know these objects are just nothing but a of z, b of z, c of z, d of z, depending on the choice of sigma and sigma prime. That's nothing but the sum summation over, so where is the summation? The summation now is in this region. There's an edge here which has to be summed over. So this one I'm gonna call sigma double prime, and and then if you think carefully, because you have to read from left to right, so when one needs to think really hard, so okay, let me just, so this is the sigma here, sigma prime. So I have to think really hard. So the first one will be, uh, so, so yeah, there's a probability one half, I'll get it wrong as usual. So I think it's this way, sigma second prime. Sigma prime sigma, I think. Do you agree, Jules? Anyway, it's either that or the other around, but probably this one. Okay, so this is actually a fun check to do, that only using, you know, the, uh, so, so there are things to be proved to say, you know, this is, this is an actual theorem, if you like, or proposition at least, uh, that, you know, delta satisfies all these properties that so they need to be checked. If you wanna have fun, you can check them. I'm not gonna do that. It's just kind of formal nonsense, but it works. And, um, and so this is really interesting because when you have a yeah, co-product, co that means you can do some more interesting representation theory. You could do tensor products of representations. And so I, if you're interested in that, look at that exercise um, uh, in the uh, exercise session later today. All right, I'm closing this uh, parenthesis and get, getting back to algebraic beta ansatz. Okay, well, I'm erasing, I can't help pointing out the fact that this is the first step towards uh, basically quantum groups, so more precisely quantized affine algebras. So uh, the next step is to try to formalize further and you'll not naturally be led to the notion of a quantum group basically out of this uh, young Baxter algebra business. But we're not gonna do that. All right, um, so what are we gonna do? Oh, I forgot to define the uh, co-unit, oops. The co-unit co is kind of stupid. Co-unit is just the one where there is no physical space. So that's delta of 
t, I'm oh, sorry, epsilon, yeah, epsilon of uh, t i j of z is just delta, or si sigma, damn it, sigma, sigma prime is just delta sigma sigma prime. So morally, it's just the line like this. It's telling you this is the trivial case where there is no somehow uh, physical line, so, okay. Um, all right, skip, skip, skip. Algebraic bit on that, yes. So let's get back to the diagonalization of our actual explicit monotony matrix, uh, the transfer, transfer matrix. Um, so recall that we have T of Z, which is the trace over the zero space of uh, T of Z, uh, so which is the same as A of Z plus D of Z. And there are no more hats. We're talking about actual, you know, matrices of size to the power L, and we're trying to diagonalize. Well, diagonalize, okay, let's just say we're trying to find some eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Whether we actually get all of them is a subtle issue, so I'm not gonna go there. Um, so how do you go about, well, at least finding eigenvectors of T of Z? There's one small remark which, uh, s s s which should be made at this stage is that, remember that the R matrix satisfies the ice rule, which means um, there is actually already a kind of block structure of this uh, uh, transfer matrix, which means it's not, it's not a completely general uh, matrix, just like the R matrix itself, it has a block structure. And the reason it, it does so is the following. Um, consider, so this is very similar to what was in one of the exercises um, uh, yesterday. Consider the, let's say the matrix denoted sigma z, which is the two by two diagonal matrix, one minus one, zero, zero, and then define sigma i z to be one tensor, one tensor, one tensor sigma z on the ith position space i, so this lives already in endomorphism sub C2 central L, where i is some value between one and L, and well, that's not very well written. Anyway, it's not much better. And, and finally define the uh, total uh, spin, so I don't know, maybe big sigma z to be um, the sum of, from, I, from one to L of um, sigma i as z. So it's basically the sum of uh, all these matrices acting at different sides. And what does this mean in terms of, in terms of a kind of the graphical notations? Well, it's very easy. It's telling, it's counting, if you have a, um, if you have a, a, a basis vector um, given by basically a tensor product um, of sigma i, where remember the, these are just the uh, basis vectors, plus is just a one zero, and um, one, minus is a zero one, then this is literally just counting the number of, uh, um, you know, the number of minuses, the number of pluses minus the number of minuses of this state. All right, so it's an operator which is convenient because it kind of, you know, its eigenvalues are obvious. It's just integers from whatever, minus L to L equal to uh, L mod two or whatever. And it's just counting for you the number of pluses and minus uh, spins, All right? So, uh, so for example, uh, if you, if, even more explicitly, if you take uh, sigma z acting on all pluses, right, plus, 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 um, it's just uh, whatever it is, L times plus, 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 right? But where by this notation, slightly condensed notation, I mean the tensor product of all these uh, one zeros. And similarly, you know, if you take all the minus ones, all the minuses, uh, you get um, minus L, and everybody else in somewhere in between, right? You're just counting the number of pluses minus the number of minuses, right? Now the claim is that because of the ice rule, uh, because of the ice rule, um, we have the commutation T of Z, uh, sigma Z equals zero. And what it's telling you is basically, if you want to think in terms of path, it means, you know, path have to go somewhere. You know, this is also, if you prefer, the number of path minus the number, I mean by that, the number of occupied sites minus the number of empty sites. And you know, when you have a, any configuration uh, and you have this transfer matrix where remember the, the condition, the, we have periodic boundary conditions 
That means you have a certain number of uh, occupied edges at the bottom. Well, the claim is that that should be the same number at the top because the path have to go somewhere, basically. So for example, maybe it can go here and then go up, and maybe this one can go straight up. But the point is, no, no matter how you do it, there's going to be the same number of occupied sites at the top and at the bottom. So that's just what this is telling you. So it's just a reformulation of the ice rule. Ah, oops. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So when you have two operators that commute, that means you could diagonalize them simultaneously, which means in practice you can restrict yourself to a sector where there is a given number of uh, path going through, basically. So in particular, uh, yeah, so we don't need the digression anymore. In particular, there are sort of two trivial sectors of dimension one where you've already diagonalized your uh, transfer matrix. Uh, so let's do that first. That's kind of warming up. So in other words, we, are, we have already found, thanks to these two eigenvectors, and these are the ones that are written here. If you take, in particular, if you take T of Z times just all pluses, that means you're doing, so let's do the uh, kind of path notation. Um, so we have path everywhere, let's say. And so what can happen? There are only two possibilities. Uh, either, so you, you start anywhere on the horizontal line. So the claim is that there are two, two options here. Um, well, let, let me already write what the answer is because, yeah. So either the horizontal, oh, and oh, it's always periodic. Um, either the, somewhere, you, you start somewhere on the horizontal line and you say either this is occupied, but then by, by ice rule, this has to go through because you have two incoming lines there for two outgoing lines and it has to go all the way through basically. Or the, uh, this line is empty, so empty, whatever that was supposed to be. And then again by the ice rule because there's one, okay, no, that's, uh, Badly explained. Um, yeah, so the claim is that there's only one way. This, if, if, the, if the auxiliary line is empty, then it goes empty all the way, and you also have everything going through. Um, yeah, what's the one line proof of this? Um, well, if it weren't, if we were occupied somewhere, uh, um, yeah, so, so you do it by contradiction. Suppose at some, some point suddenly it became occupied, then you would, you would get back to the original situ the situation above where you have two lines coming through, so that other line would go all the way through, and we eventually would reach back to the original spot where we assumed it was empty, therefore contradiction. So these are the only two possibilities, right? And so what that means in practice is that automatically at the top you always have all occupied, which is, means the result is still plus, 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 plus. And the only question is what is the coefficient? Well, the coefficient is what? It's um, either all, all vertices of type A or all vertices of type B. That means this is nothing but A of Z to the power L plus B of Z to the power L. And the exact same re reasoning works for the other uh, state, which is all minuses, where again, by, by just by this argument of conservation, we know that the result will still be in the same sector, will, all, will be proportional to minus, 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 and you play the same game, and obviously it's gonna be the same, basically. So you're gonna get the same uh, eigenvalue, A of Z plus B of Z to the power L. And let me give a name to that eigenvalue. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Let me give a name to that eigenvalue. Let me call it, uh, um, yeah, let me call it A of zero of Z plus uh, D zero of Z, where, um, yes, where A zero of Z is the, uh, yeah, so you can see actually from this picture that actually diagonalizes both A of Z and D of Z separately, because basically this is re really secretly nothing but A of Z applied to this thing, and this is D of Z. So really, th that's, why it may, that's why you always have two contributions in some sense to the uh, eigenvalue. So it, just a motivation for the notation, which is uh, what I just wrote here. Um, B. Right. Um, yeah, so probably I should have said that rather than, yeah. In fact, from this picture, you can see that more, more precisely, we have actually this identity. Um, and separately, 
this one. I guess that's that's what I mean here. So that's why it's natural, yeah, to separate the uh, eigenvalue into two pieces. Um, so this is essentially A, and this is uh, D. All right, so anyway, we found two eigenvectors, uh, but of course, you know, that's not the end of the story. We have still uh, two to the L minus two uh, vectors to, uh, eigenvectors to find. And, and so the idea now is we need operators that somehow, so we, the idea was we're gonna start from one of these base, base cases, doesn't matter which one. Uh, I guess I'll start with pluses. And, um, and then we'll, we're gonna build other eigenvectors out of this uh, special eigenvector. Uh, this is the procedure of uh, algebraic beta ansatz. And so for that, we need operators that actually change the, the number of pluses and minuses. So this is the part where we go back to our uh, monotony matrix and realize that we have now more operators at our disposal than just uh, some transfer matrix. Well, we have A and D, but A and D are boring. Both of them also preserve the number of, uh, uh, so in other words, it's actually stronger than that. Again, I should have probably said that at this stage, A of Z uh, separately and D of Z, all, each of them individually commutes with, um, with the uh, number of uh, lines, operator. So we're gonna need um, to use other operators which change the number of lines. So let's, let's see, for example, suppose you, you use B operators. So recall that B, ah, actually, yeah, conveniently, B is still there. So if you use, for example, if you look, for example, the, the B operator and you, you, you apply it to some state, you know, maybe with two blue lines. Um, no. Did I get it wrong? Is my B, this, which one increases the number of lines which one decreases it? Oh, did I screw this up? Uh, you're right, yeah. Yeah, sadly I, I wrote it wrong. Apologies, I guess my sigma zero and sigma prime zero were the wrong way. This is the input, this is the output. So this was actually incorrect. Yeah. I got confused for a sec because I know for a fact that, yeah, it's the other way around. Yeah, sorry about that. So let's take an example of how B acts. Uh, remember the lines are kind of going this way. And so it, it takes an empty line and at the end some line must come out the other way. So clearly one of the lines is gonna die somehow. So for example, what could happen is this blue line comes out here and this one maybe just goes straight, straight up. And if you had two blue lines at the top, you only have, sorry, two blue lines at the bottom, you have one blue line at the top. So it changes the number of blue lines by minus one. And of course, similarly, C of, C of Z would increase the number of blue lines by one. So you increase the occupancy number by one. So these are good operators because if you like, they kind of jump from block to block inside your block decomposition of T of Z, increasing or decreasing the uh, uh, number, of, um, um, number of lines. So the incre increasing or decreasing the eigenvalue of uh, sigma of Z by two. So here comes the actual, oh, right. Here comes the actual algebraic beta, beta ansatz. So an ansatz means we make a sort of educated guess on what the eigenvectors should look like. And then uh, in the remaining 10, 10 minutes, I will actually try to prove to you uh, that this ansatz makes sense. Um, so the actual algebraic beta ansatz is, is the following. You say, what about building a vector starting from say the, the, this plus 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 state and acting on it by a bunch of B operators? And the question is, you know, is this an eigenvector, basically? Of, oh, sorry. Where m is some uh, non-negative uh, integer. Uh, is this an eigenvector? Okay, so of course, it's, in general, it's not gonna be true, but we have a bunch of parameters at our disposal where the z1, zm have some parameters, some complex, non-zero complex number. And so we have the choice of these uh, parameters. All right, so, so here comes the, um, uh, the theorem. Um, uh, psi is an, is an, so this is a 
not an if and only if, it's going to give you a, it's an if statement. If um, the, the zi's are uh, eigenvector of t of z, sure. Uh, yes. Um, if the zi's satisfy the following beta and that's equations, Um, a0 of zj, uh, product of a, k equals 1 to m of t, sorry, zk over zj, um, plus minus 1 to the m d0 of zj, product, oh, sorry, yeah, product k equals one to m. Um, yeah, a of uh, z j over z k equals zero. That's first part of the, the the theorem. And if so, the eigenvalue is okay. Maybe I'll uh, write it somewhere else. Eigenvalue is. Um, Uh, so in other words, t of z times psi equals some, you know, t of z times psi, where t of z is a sudden function. Uh, it's just a number, if you like, and this number is a zero of z times product k equals one to m of uh, a z k over z divided by b of z k over z um, plus d, zero of z times product k equals one to m of a of z over z k over b of z over z k. Uh, yes. All right, so in the final seven minutes, I'll give the proof of this statement. Um, this is all based on these RTG relations. So I promised that earlier that, you know, I'd write these things slightly more explicitly. So remember that T of Z is really this two by two matrix of operators and there are really 16 different relations. And so among the RTG relations, you get a bunch of relations that we don't really need right now. And if you want to play with them, the, one of the exercises about that, but, um, you know, the ones that we actually care for our purposes are the following. Um, all right, so where is it? All right, here we go. Um, the first thing is that when you have B operators, they actually commute with each other. So B of Z1, B of Z2, sorry, this is not a minus sign, um, equals B of Z2, B of Z1. So it's not too hard to see that B at different values of the parameters uh, commute with each other. That means in particular in this product, the ordering of the Z's doesn't actually matter because you can sw switch, switch them, you get the same state. So um, we need of course, you know, because T is actually given in, in terms of A plus D, is A plus D and we have B here, we need some commutation relations between the A's uh, and the B's and also the D's and the B's. So uh, let me write these. Um, relations for you. So one of, one of them says B of Z2 over Z1, A of Z1, B of Z2 equals uh, A of Z2 over Z1, uh, B of Z2, A of Z1, um, minus C of Z2 over Z1, 
b of z1, a of z2. And there's another one for d. Okay, I'll write it anyway, but I guess maybe I'll do only the duration for a rather than d. We'll see, depending on time. But anyway, let me do the other one. b of z1 over z2 of uh, d of z1, uh, b of z2 equals a of z1 over z2, uh, b of z2, maybe I can just raise it, uh, a of z1, I'm oh, sorry, d of z1, uh, minus c of z1 over z2, and the obvious other thing, so b of uh, z1, d of z2. So these are always, you know, quadratic relations involving this a's and d's and b's and c's and d's. And, um, well, here goes nothing. We're gonna do some uh, commutation. Uh, I probably erased the only thing I actually needed, was, which was the fact that the plus 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 is an eigenvector of a and d, but that's okay, we will remember it. So how's it, how does it go? So t of z times psi is, you know, a of z times psi plus uh, d. And so as I said, maybe I won't have time to do both. So I'll, I'll, I'll do one ex in, you know, I'll do ca calculation of one of these two terms and I'll leave the other one uh, for if you want to have fun. So let's just do a of z times psi. So it's a of z times b of z1 dot 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 b of z m times plus plus. And now the idea is that uh, we want to, because this is an eigenvector of a of z, it's very tempting to try to move a of z across all the b's until it hits this one, and then bingo, it's an eigenvector. And of course, things are not going to be that simple, but that's the, the idea. So we can, we can start applying, for example, uh, once uh, this identity here. And we say that, for example, this using the identity, okay, maybe I'm going to give it the number, it's this identity number two. Um, so let's see, how does it go? So it becomes um, a of z2 over z1. Sorry, a of, sorry, no, no, no. Uh, let's see, z1, b of z2. So a of z1 over z over b of z1 over z times um, b of z1, a of z plus uh, minus uh, c of z1 over z divided by b of z1 over z uh, times b of z, a of z1. And then you have all the rest. b of z2 dot 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 b of zm psi. Uh, plus, plus, plus. Okay, so um, this is pretty good because you actually managed to move a one step to the right. The only price you had to pay is sometimes the arguments get switched. But clearly, you know, this is not too bad, right? Because we can keep applying the same argument and I try to commute A of Z with B of Z2 and whatever, all that's ever gonna happen is we're gonna get the arguments mixed up. But eventually after M iterations of this process, we're gonna get something of this form. We're gonna get a big sum of two to the M terms. And so let me just write what the form of the, of the uh, sum will be. Uh, eventually the A will be completely at the right and, um, yeah, I guess I should separate, right. So maybe I'll write it in, yeah. So there'll be A at the right with some argument. Let's just do, do it slightly schematically for now and then we'll write it more precisely. And then a bunch of Bs. And the arguments collectively are permutations of, um, permutation of, um, z, z1, dot, 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 zm. And then there's, there's some coefficient here. So let's rewrite this slightly more precisely. This is just for intuition, but more precisely, what do we get? Remember that the b's commute among themselves, so it doesn't really matter which arguments the b get. As soon as you know which argument a has, all the other ones are just the, the remaining arguments, basically. So slightly more specifically, that means we have one term where a is actually just uh, a of z times plus, plus, plus. And then we have some coefficient which will compute times b of z1, b of zm. And then we have a bunch of terms where the argument did get exchanged. So some 
uh, from k equals 1 to m of b of all the z's except one got switched into a, of the zi except one has become a, a z. So there is no uh, zk. And then a of zk, and then plus, plus, plus. And there is, each time there is a coefficient, so maybe let me give it a name. So this is c of kappa k. Kappa k is not terrible, but it, not such a great name. But anyway, and, and so, and here also there's a coefficient. Maybe let me call it kappa zero. And so the question is, what are these coefficients? All right, so in the remaining minus one minutes, let me tell you how to compute these coefficients. Uh, as I said, we'll only do it for A and not for D. The principle is the same. So I claim that the, the first one is not too bad, kappa zero. Because there's only a, a unique way by doing these relations you can get the first term. That's when A of Z kind of never gets switched. Because as soon as you get switched, uh, the argument gets stuck. So you, you th should think of this as kind of a process where Z is kind of moving to the right. And as soon as it gets switched, it's really bad. So you only ever need to use, if you want to make sure that A of Z gets all the way to the right, you should always use the first of the two terms in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this relation number two. So that means the coefficient is quite easy to compute. It's just literally just the product k equals 1 to m of uh, a of zk over z, oops, zk over z divided by b of zk over z. And let me check quickly with, that I agree with my notes. Um, yes. There's one more which is not too hard to compute. Uh, so this is, yeah. There's one more which is not too hard to compute is if you want to do, uh, if that's the one where z1 goes all the way. Because it's the same principle except with this term. That means at the first step you, you, you use the second term, but then the same principle applies. If, as soon as you use another time, the second term in the relation, the Z1 gets stuck somewhere in the middle and it'll never make it to the end. So with the same reasoning, you find that kappa 1 contains exactly once. Uh, so it's like minus uh, C of Z1 over Z um, divided by B of Z1 over Z. And then all the other ones are just uh, product chi K not equal to 1 of a of zk over z, um, b of zk over z. And again, let me check quickly that I agree with my notes. Um, ah, sorry. No. Ah, that's right. Correct. Thank you. Yes, because in, in the meantime, yeah, that's right, absolutely. Right, and so to make a long story short, the claim is that, so there are various ways you can convince yourself that in fact this is already the general expression for, in fact, yeah, let me write the answer. Uh, you can write that kappa j is literally always equal to c of zj over z divided by, so the same expression in which you basically permute the, the z's to um, k not equal to j of a of zk over zj divided by b of zk over zj. And the reason this is true, so if, once you have this on you can just prove it by induction. So prove by induction, let's just say. Um, but the, the reason the, this on is, is natural is remember that the, uh, um, uh, this expression is actually symmetric in, in, with respect to exchange of the z's. So you str it's, it's very tempting to speculate that the kappa j's and all the kappa j's should be obtained from each other by exchange of the variable zj. Unfortunately, this is hard to turn into a rig rigorous reasoning because uh, it, it relies on the assumption that the corresponding vectors are independent, linearly independent, which is not easy to show in general. Thank you. But it, as I said, the, 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 the striking feature is the fact that these coefficients are, are symmetric by, uh, with respect to exchange of the zj, which is consistent, consistent with the fact that the original vector was invariant by the substitutions of the uh, exchange of the zj's. So it's natural, but you actually, to actually prove this, you just do it by induction on uh, M. That's the best way I know how to prove it. At the end of the day, um, well, you, so you have the explicit answer for what um, uh, the uh, action on, of, let's say, of A is, and I'm going to just write the answer for, for um, D. Um, so the answer is, therefore, that uh, you have those coefficients, kappa zero, and then 
A of z now is an eigenvector of, uh, sorry, plus 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 is an eigenvector of A, which means you just get A zero of z times plus plus plus. And that looks looking pretty good, because that means this part looks like everything is an eigenvector, but of course, it's not that simple. There are some terms, sort of so-called unwanted terms, which are all the other terms, plus a bunch of basically junk we don't really want, but which happens to be there. Um, so B Z one, B Z in the middle, no Z K, uh, B Z M, and then similarly, oh, and there's also A zero of Z K. Sorry, what? Ah, sorry, right. Sorry. Yeah. Let's try again. This is A applied to psi, and this is psi now. And then this, 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 these unwanted terms that we don't know what to do with. And with the exact same reasoning, D of Z acting on psi is equal to um, kappa prime zero, um, D zero of Z psi, plus a bunch of unwanted terms obtained in the commutation relations, the sum of K equals zero to M, so maybe I'll raise <laughs> this. Uh, of kappa prime k times b of z1 dot 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 b of z in the middle somewhere b of zm and then um, there's also uh, as usual I forgot a uh, plus 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 and I forgot as usual the d0 of zk somewhere. Now uh, the convenience thing is that you notice that these terms actually look the same. They are the same form. They're just basically some product of b acting on plus 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 and so with a bit of luck if uh, the coefficients in front combined are zero, uh, then you're, you're, you're only left with these two terms and you're get, you get an eigenvector, basically. And if you actually compute explicitly what kappa prime k plus kappa k, uh, you know, kappa k times a, a zero of z k plus kappa prime k of d zero of z k is, you'll get exactly uh, these equations here. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter, because uh, if you, if you, yeah, so I, I rewrote it slightly by including the, the term k equals j in there because it's, uh, it's a sign, basically, or something. I, I, uh, yeah, it's basically the same. All right, so we'll stop here. Say it again?